live, so it's starting. Okay, great. Um, I think we're live, so uh, hi everyone, welcome. Uh, thanks to, uh, for bearing with us for a few minutes. With us for a few minutes while we got everyone on board. Um, I'm gonna ask Sam to introduce this. Yeah. And, yeah. So thanks again. Um, so Sandra and I work on the World Bank Finance team, where we try to make open data about the World Bank more useful and reusable. And one of the things I think uh, that we've learned looking at open data, you know, how people are using it, is that there isn't a place where all of these things are, are in one central place where people can find examples. I mean, because ultimately um, what interests us is, you know, what are people doing with this? How can these solutions be adapted, scaled, or applied in other places? Basically, what can help people utilize these stores of information? And how can this help them ask for other kinds of information that they might be able to use? And, and um, be able to um, utilize in their work and, and in various different ways. So uh, we embarked on this study with the IDB, and we're very, very happy to uh, have Antonio with us as well. And so Antonio, maybe you could say a few words as well about kind of what this project means and sort of why uh, the IDB is involved in it. Yeah, hello, good morning, everyone. Um, so at the IDB, we recently launched six months ago a blog about open knowledge, uh, and we discuss issues and developments in open data, open access, and, and developments in open knowledge in general. And we found that there is a, still a, an even discussion between countries about uh, the, the open data. There are some countries that have taken the lead uh, and are doing many, many things around open data. There's a lot of entrepreneurship. Uh, uh, entrepreneurial activity, there are policymakers that are much more involved in some countries than in others. And I think we, we, there is a, a, lot of, um, uh, a lot of potential in, in the region. So uh, basically with this uh, study, what we wanted to know is to illustrate what is being done in other parts of the world and inspire uh, people to, to think about new projects and, and understand the, the potential of open data. So uh, it's a great collaboration with the World Bank because we can uh, mix uh, experiences from different parts of the world, and and I'm very much looking forward to uh, today. Thanks, Antonio. Um, so I want to introduce um, our guest this week um, from da Data Science LTD, um, which is a data analysis and research company in Kenya with services to government, local organizations, and businesses. Um, Data science helps clients use um, available and new data to gain insights for planning, resource allocation, and uh, profit making. Our guest is, and data science founder is Lynette Kwamboka, who has been on the forefront of coordinating the Kenya Open Data Initiative and the Open Government Partnership for the Government of Kenya and for the World Bank. We're really, really excited. Um, Lynette has certainly been a friend of our program for, for years now, um, and we're excited uh, to learn more about data science and the good work of her and her team. Yeah, so Lynette, if I um, want to turn it over to you to give us a little bit of background about the type of work that you're doing, and then we have some questions lined up for you. Yeah? Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Lynette Pombohan, and I'm the founder of Data Science Limited. Uh, we do a lot of data analytics research aggregation uh, for, as Sandra mentioned, multiple uh, forms of companies from government, civil society, and local private organizations. Um, the main or key focus of our work is uh, mostly just trying to get people to appreciate the um, power of data and what really data can do for uh, their businesses or even the decisions that they make. Uh, for us to be able to see um, a nation or just the people that are able to use information very wi wisely and be able to make decisions but also to be able to make lots of money. Yeah. Okay. So if, if you don't mind, Lynette, maybe we'll just ask, um, dive a little bit deeper into some of the work that you're doing. And um, first off, I think it's really exciting. I and mean, we've kind of known, uh, we've, we've known you and kind of followed your work uh, for the past few years. And it's, it's both remarkable kind of what you're able to do, and so and also how many different stakeholders you're able to work with. Um, but maybe maybe we'll start with kind of when you started to look at, uh, when you were starting to work with data and open data, what made you want to start data science, and sort of what were the, the, the problems, and what was the inspiration that kind of led you to do that? 
Uh, well, I guess my inspiration uh, during my time at uh, Open Data that, that pushed me to wanting to start my own company is the fact that I was in a unique position that allowed me to be able to see the real potential of data, especially at government level, and what uh, could be done. Um, and I tried to tell people who were in the private sector because it was it's not the government's mandate to be able to make profits out of you know that kind of uh, information. So I tried to you know have meetings with people and just trying to show them how to incorporate uh, data within their organizations, or to even start their own organizations or companies uh, that would uh, dwell on data analytics as a concept. Because I had seen a lot of the global northern countries had already started catching up with that. Uh, it was also in the advent of uh, big data. But then most, mostly people really did not see that. So I, I thought it was an opportunity that, um, that uh, you know, presented a very clear gap in the market. Uh, it's not a, a, you know, a very full market yet, but I thought there was a clear potential for what we can do and how we can grow everyone. So I decided I could just go out and you know, just go ahead and do it. Yeah. And in terms of um, the types of clients you have, are there any specific sectors or specific areas that, that you're working in that you see um, particular, uh, where you see a, a lot more potential for the use of data? Um, actually, it's uh, it's amazing because our clients are just everywhere. Uh, we have a range from you know government, civil society, and private sector. Um, so government, of course, it's always just about uh, one understanding you know what data exists and how to uh, put it out there in a way that is uh, more useful for private sector and, and uh, you know civil society. Um, in civil society, most of the work is always around you know citizens. So trying to understand the citizen. Why does a citizen behave in a certain way, and what kind of data you know would be relevant for them? So um, th that is kind of very you know static. But then in in private sector, it's just all over the place. Um, you know, we have people interested in uh, various kinds of things in marketing, in jobs, in you know retail, in cars, and and things. So it's it's all it's all very very different. There isn't one specific sector. Where I would say you know there's there's more demand than the other. Um, the thing is, I know most of these are coming, but but right now it's just scattered all over the place. So I, I think there's full potential for for good data if it's available. Mm -hmm. Maybe we could talk also about like the specific um, examples that you have. So you mentioned civil society. Could you share a little bit about um, what specifically you're doing with data, what types of data you're taking, and what sort of challenges organizations are trying to solve? Um, uh, the one um, project that we're working on in civil society is on the data revolution, actually, uh, which is just uh, why should a citizen care about data? I mean, last week the World Bank had uh, such kind of a forum uh, where someone said, why should someone without a toilet care about uh, about data, about open data? So we're, we're just going out and, and, and doing a lot more now. That is the research arm of the company, where we're doing a lot more research, trying to understand, speaking to people, and trying to not only understand why they should care, um, but then also trying to come up with a kind of a framework that would allow you know other countries to, to, to make their citizens care. I mean, if they use that kind of framework, that they would be able to achieve you know uh, maximum returns on uh, citizens being able to say yes, we want more information uh, to work. Yeah. And and what kind of tools and techniques are you using to um, you know make the existing data a bit more relatable or understandable? Or is, is there a process for transforming the information? Um, yes. So a lot of the work we do at the end of the day, the main product is always a data visual. Uh, this is a charts, graphs. Uh, we have maps. Um, but then this is all, you know, written in uh, JSON, uh, D3, PHP, Java. You know, there's a, a, a whole mix of, you know, programming languages uh, that are out there right now. You know, uh, we have someone looking into R and, and trying to look more into statistical data anal and analysis. So it's all uh, demand driven. Depending on what a client wants, then we go out and look at what is the best tool to actually use for that. Uh, but mo mostly, what we get, uh, we try to say that what we're trying to do is to make uh, data science as a you know as a concept 
as simple as possible and not presenting to people what they do not understand. So at the end of the day, after all the you know tedious work that goes in, what you see is the map and you might think that someone did that in a day, but mostly a lot of what powers that is, is, is a lot more complex. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Antonio, do you have any questions that, uh, for Lynette? Yeah, my, my question, uh, I have seen that many, many organizations and, for example, the World Bank is incorporating now, like, data scientists in their, in their organization as a, like, the main, main point of contact for all what relates to data. Uh, and I wanted to, to hear your opinion on this and, and how do you see organizations uh, incorporating this, this role into, into their structures and, and what do you think the potential can be for it? Um, there's uh, th there's very big uh, potential for data right now to to lie within organizations. I guess uh, just like any kind of uh, new concept, it's harder for organizations to invest uh, a lot in having um, you know someone come in and sit within the organization and try to figure out. And I guess that's when outsourcing to companies like you know ours actually happens. But it's definitely something that uh, needs to happen. Uh, and I'm sure the World Bank is already seeing the returns of having you know, a full-time data scientist within the organization. Um, it's something that is definitely very important. It's, it's not, especially in our world right now, uh, something that is going to happen you know, uh, you know, very soon because also some of these skills are not, you know, when we're thinking about a data scientist, some of these skills have to be uh, developed. Uh, so most organizations might not be willing to take that risk or to you know start or, you know investing in that, but it's definitely something that is very important to do. Yeah. And and I had a question about um, innovation. Uh, one of the the issues that interests me the most is uh, what can open data do and big data in general for innovation within organizations and specifically in development organizations. So I would like to understand. How could we think about like a, a framework where we can start explaining how open data contributes to to innovation? Um, open data definitely contributes to innovation in in, in so many ways. And um, when you're thinking about the idea of open data, when especially you know when open data becomes open government data, most of this data is just given out in its raw format. Uh, they, there's really sometimes no organization with it, it's unstructured, and I'm guessing it's out of this, uh, which normally becomes big data, and it's out of this that we have innovations like no SQL databases that deal with unstructured data. So um, th th there's a lot of uh, innovations that ca can come out of, you know, one, structuring this data to make sense, um, and then two, just visualizing or analyzing these data for people who don't have the time or capacity to actually do that. So I feel there's, there's definitely um, a lot of potential in, um, in, in that. Um, you know, transforming these data from uh, what we call interpreting, really, uh, from that raw format that was provided as open data uh, to a format that, um, when we're talking about development organizations, that a citizen can actually want to care about or want to, you know, stop and think about, um, which is something that they normally don't have in terms of, you know, tools, techniques, or in, uh, just knowledge itself. So I feel there's just definitely a lot of uh, potential in, in being able to be innovative around uh, open data. But, um, you know, one, one big mistake that I see a lot of people making is they take one piece of data and want to innovate around that without wanting to you know, incorporate many other concepts to be able to come up with one more or less concept. Yeah. Can you give a, an example of that, um, of that mistake, if you will? Um, well, we've heard a lot about you know, the app, uh, you know, app development concepts around you know, the Nairobi Turkey events. And I have uh, been in a good position to be able to look at some of these uh, applications where you know, someone creates an app out of data about hospitals. I have an app that tells you where the hospitals in all rural communities are. Chances are people who live in rural communities know where their hospitals are. You know, um, so you creating an app really does not add any value, but you creating an app that tells them that hospital B, which is in another community, 
has a facility that you need for this kind of injury as opposed to your own hospital, then you're starting to add value because someone wants to say, um, well, I have this kind of illness, this hospital might be very close to me, but it will not help me, or it doesn't have enough doctors, or it doesn't have these specialists, I need to go to this other place. So, you know, um, in terms of education, uh, sh just showing where the schools are is not important. For me, you know, making a decision about where to take my child to school, but telling me what the student-teacher ratios are, you know, the performance of these schools, uh, integrating that with, uh, you know, what are the dropout rates, for example. Those are some of the things, or which neighborhood, you know, these are three, four, five different data sets that you mash up together, and out of these, you can create interest. But then, um, and, and then one last example is I think a lot of people also create apps without necessarily taking into consideration the culture of the communities. So but I think, I mean, it was interesting to hear her talk about apps that are being developed and focusing on a specific data set versus actual need and thinking about, mm -hmm. like, what the real problem is. I thought that was really interesting because, you know, when we roll out data for people to use, a lot of times you kind of shove data and say, how did you use this? And that's, I think, a very, <laughs> it's not a very optimal approach, but one that a lot of people have have tried, yeah. including ourselves. We've made that mistake in the past as well. Yes. And you get some interesting apps, but no, they're not very useful. Yeah. Lynette, you're back. Yes, I am. <laughs> I'm so sorry. We lost you. We were right at this really, really like important piece where you're talking about the um, bringing in the, the cultural aspect of the community that you're trying to build yeah. this app for. And then you froze. Technology happens like that when you need it most, I guess. <laughs> Yeah. So I don't know if you have it in you to finish that thought. Um, I guess I was done, yeah. I, I think I think I was just saying that, you know, people need to, to do a little more research um, to, to understand the communities. And, and I'm trying to, to, to speak a lot more on, uh, you know, what Antonia is saying when we're talking about uh, development kinds of organizations. You need to understand more where the communities are coming from. Uh, we had one, you know, uh, example where a journalist went down to find out where why these communities not using toilets for example and uh, you know you would say but you know a development organization spent so much money in building you all these toilets but you've never used them why and they say culturally I'm not allowed to go to the same toilet as what as my wife or my children and my wife is not allowed to go to the same toilet as my children so you know something like that if these guys had done some kind of research before they, be, uh, they spent millions building toilets, you know, then they, they would have saved lots of money or they would have done more sensitization before they did that. But yeah. Wow. That's a strong point. So I'm curious how you would redesign the way um, you know, when, when people do apps challenges or hackathons, how would you reinvent that or redesign it in a way to optimize what you're talking about? I think if I was to do an app challenge or, you know, a hackathon, I would, you know, do it over a week where a week is seven days, have five days of people going out to the field and speaking to people, doing your research. And it reminds me about, you know, when I was uh, studying data science. Um, I spent the first two months just having lots of coffee, which meant sleepless nights, um, with people finding out if you were to hire data science, what would you want them to do for you? You know, um, then then understanding that oh, you know, when I when I was uh, thinking of studying, we were thinking about the complex um, kinds of predictive analysis and models using R and everything. As I mentioned before, it's just now we are having st someone start to learn how to use R. Uh, you know, initially I was like, I have all this knowledge and we can study it, and then you realize. People at a completely different level. So I would say going out, spending time with people and solving a need that is out there, you know, understanding what people want, then finding the data, uh, or, the, or then after that requesting for that data, and then building uh, the apps. Uh, what normally happens is people start building the apps while looking for the data, and then try to sell it to people. You end up with all these pink elephants while people just want blue ones. I'm, I'm sorry to keep asking more questions. I'm curious, so when I you know this is difficult and probably uh, it, that would vary across different clients and the solutions that you have, but what percentage of data that you're using is open data versus data that uh, you're 
either collecting or that's proprietary to a specific source? Um, I could say 50%. Um, except for situations where we are uh, explicitly only required to develop an analytical tool for clients' data, then give it to them and move on. Uh, we use 50% open data on all the projects that we do. And this is 50% because we take what is available out there, so we spend lots of time at the National Bureau of Statistics Library, um, and then we try to, you know, use this to advise what the client's data, ha uh, what the client's data says. So at any given point, there are only two data sets where there's open data and client data, and it's all 50-50 at any given point, yeah. Wow. Antonio, did you have a question? You look ready. Uh, yeah. No, I, I had um, some questions about um, maybe indicators that you use generally to measure. Uh, I mean, one of the issues that interests us the most is evaluating impact of open data and, and reuse of open data. So I would like to understand more how would you measure it if you're actually measuring it in, in some way and specifically thinking about one need that governments, I think, need to, to have, um, which is evaluating the impact of their public policies, for example, using open data. So what indicators or how would you measure this, this impact? Um, I don't think that we have gone out to actually try and measure impact because for us it's very it, it's kind of very clear to see when you present to a client that this is where um, you know uh, market data says you should or this is where everyone else in the market is and this is where you are. Uh, but I don't think that we have uh, you know had to um, look specifically at uh, at, at the impact. Uh, analysis uh, in, in terms of open data. But I think for governments, one of the ways that they would, you know, uh, start to see um, the impact of open data, the, you know, the data that has been put out there is, there, there could be something like how many businesses, ha you know, are being started around uh, data to just see how effective the data or how useful the data that uh, they're putting out is. Uh, how, you know, how many references are are on open data in research papers out there. Just this afternoon, I was uh, speaking to a PhD student who's doing uh, her research on open data. Um, the unfortunate thing, especially one with uh, what we have at uh, opendata.geo.ke, is we don't require that you report back to you know the government when you are using open data. So it becomes a bit harder to track really, uh, you know, how, um, what the impact has been. But in terms of indicators, just looking at how many references how many businesses have been started. But then um, if you go down to the citizens, how many uh, conversations are being started just as a result of you know, having someone sit a few people in a room and give them you know, some data about what is happening within their community. Yeah. I have a question, Lynette. Um, do you have like, a favorite outcome of the work that you've done so far? Um, you don't have to talk about you know the name of the client or, or what specifically, but there is something where you came and were like, oh my god, I can't believe we did this, um, and share it if you. Uh, a favorite outcome, more. Um, well, I, I'll th I think of one that is specific to that, but more of a surprising outcome for us was uh, for, for this one client where, you know, we we're, tr were trying to compare how they are doing in the market. Um, and, and we're using open data, of course, and, and, and you know, looking at how the, you know, the movement of the graph was so similar in, in, in their operations before they went full-blown into market and what the market had, you know, it was a very small scale and what the market had was very, very large. And then at this point where I was like, yeah, that's when I maybe started seeing you know, advertisements on TV, then I started seeing all these ads on, on the internet, and the data just went up uh, and uh, actually surpassed, you know, what uh, open data has. And for a moment, they were like, but that is not right. We cannot be, not, you know, have better data than what, you know, is out there. But then I remind them, just look at the, 
the trend of the graph, it's still the same. You guys are still growing in the exact same pattern, only that now you have more data, but why do you have more data? Because you've been doing all these adverts. So just the fact that, you know, whenever people think about open government data, just open data, it's, oh, it's not good enough, it's not accurate enough. So for me, that was an indicator that open data might not be exactly 100% full, but it's a good indicator of what really is happening out here. Yes. That's great. Oh. Yeah. Can I ask one more question? Yeah. <laughs> if, if Lynette, if you yeah. have time. Lynette, is it okay? Uh, yeah, please, go ahead. <laughs> so I think one of the things that really um, I admire about the work that you're doing is how you're able to seamlessly cut through um, different stakeholder groups, mm -hmm. DSOs, the government, the private sector. And um, I'm just curious, you know, of course, that's a great advantage to you because you understand all the different perspectives and you're able to kind of have that in that um, engagement. Um, is there anything that surprises you, or are there any common grounds or misperceptions that, that you think um, kind of show up more often than not? I think it's uh, more misperceptions uh, because, uh, as, you, as you say, I'm in a very unique position because um, whenever I want to scream at the government to give me more data, I remember, oh, I am actually that person. The and then, <laughs> I, I think for me, one, it gives me a very good kind, kind of grounding of knowing what to request. And as, um, you know, when I wear my government hat, it's also knowing what we can put out. And then, you know, just, just that I understand. But the biggest mis, you know, perception is always, unfortunately, comes from civil society. Um, where there's always these requests that are being made, but then in, in most of the civil society forums, there's barely any government representative there. I mean, when, when I'm representing a client in a civil society forum, I am civil society, so I cannot be government. But then I give my perspective, uh, perspective as government. But um, just that, uh, you know, governments don't, uh, you know, they, they don't release data, soon enough, they don't, uh, you know, release accurate data, they don't do all this. There's always government, government, government. But then when you look at government processes of collecting data, a lot of people just don't understand that. But then again, I'm in a unique position because I deal with that every single day as well. Um, but then, you know, government collects data depending on which sector, every five years, every two years, every ten years. So one of my favorite things is I like to remind people that in you know, the last census carried out by the government was in 2009, uh, the next census is going to be in 2019. So up to 2019, for 10 years, you're going to use predictive, uh, predictively analyzed numbers. Um, so there's never going to be an official statistic. So today you cannot say the government is not collecting this because some of these are really expensive to actually do. And, and, and I don't think there's, uh, you know, that there's... Um, there's a place where they carry out some of the statistics every single day. But then there is opportunity for collaboration between government, civil society, and private sector, because uh, civil society collects some of this information almost on a single day, a daily basis. Um, so if they were willing enough to share their data with, uh, to complement what the government had, if you know, the private sector was willing enough to share some of its findings from the markets with what the government had, um, then I think we would have a more robust kind of uh, data set. Uh, but then, you know, it, there's always, everyone is always going to be right and every other person is always going to be wrong. But uh, yeah, that's how uh, partnerships work, I guess. So you get to be right and wrong yeah. constantly. <laughs> All the time. <laughs> You're always right. You're always right. <laughs> uh, well, yes. <laughs> uh, did any questions come up? I don't see any. Okay. I don't think we have any other questions. And if, Antonio, if you don't have any any more questions? Yeah, now, now that you have talked about the census, um, I wanted to, to ask something. Uh, we are helping some municipalities uh, start the conversation about open data. And, and basically, they haven't done anything yet on open data. And I don't think they have the resources to go out and look for what people actually need in terms of open data. So they, at some point, they have to start the conversation. And we have to help them start the conversation releasing some data. So what would be the, the number one data set that you would release uh, as a municipality to start the conversation? Um, I would say age groups. That is a very, very, in, in, in census, I would say age groups. 
um, what age groups does that is telling you in one municipality how many one-year-olds do we have, how many two-year-olds, how many five-year-olds, how many ten-year-olds? Um, because when you're planning, uh, it tells you in ten years, assuming no one dies, these are how many people we're going to have in the labor force. You know, um, in in eight years, these are how many people we are going to have, and how many of these are going to become drinkers. You know. Something like that. So it helps you in planning. So when it comes to a census, I think um, age groups are just uh, you know beyond gender distribution and all. Just age groups are very very important for future planning and and, and resource allocation. Yeah. That's a great great answer. Thank you. Very practical. Yeah. <laughs> Was that one free, Lynette? <laughs> Sorry. Was that free advice? <laughs> Um, no, no, yeah, um, I, I will be sending an invoice uh, later. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that that that's all free. It's my service to this um, to this good cause by by you guys. Antonio, we'll send you a finder's fee though. All right. <laughs> <laughs> we will contact I'm you. To, I, I'm, I'm going to need a percentage on that. No, you can keep it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, um, well, thank you, Lynette, so much for joining us. Um, uh, we'll, we're going to do a quick write-up, a small, a short write-up of this, and uh, publish it along with the, the recording. Um, and hopefully, uh, we'll stay in touch. And to, you know, I'm really excited to hear about your successes with data science, or data science dot co dot ke. Um, but we'll publish that as well. Yeah, and hopefully. Yeah. We'll Next week, we don't have a confirmed guest for next Friday's hangout. Um, but as soon as that comes, you know, that comes uh, into knowledge, we'll let everyone know. But on right now, as of um, as of right now, we have a confirmed guest for August 15th, um, and that's Crimebot in Jamaica. So hopefully, folks will join us for that. Yeah. Oh, we oh. do have. Um, oh wait, a question. We do have one question that came in. Okay. All right. So, Obo asks, "Hello, Lynette. Would you like would like to know what research projects you're currently carrying out related to open data for development?" So, um, well, I cannot unfortunately speak. I, I used to love when I could speak about everything, but I cannot unfortunately give all all, all the all, all the details. But this is more um, along the lines of working with citizens and trying to see how to you know. Uh, make sure that they become interested in open data and in creating the demand for more data to be released by government. Great. Yeah. Yeah, it was good. And uh, Obo just got yeah. it in. I hope that, that answered your question, Obo. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, and uh, happy weekend. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye, Lina. Bye. Bye.